A warm welcome to the 14th session in the third module on signals and systems. We have stated a very important principle. I dare say one of the most fundamental principles of sampling and reconstruction in the previous session. The principle said that a band limited signal, band limited to f m can be reconstructed perfectly from its samples taken at a rate more than two times f m and we saw why that is the case. Essentially, the imposters can be removed and the original can be retained if we have ensured that this Nyquist principle namely f s greater than twice f m is obeyed. And in fact, the proof of this theorem was constructive in the sense that it gave you a procedure by which you could reconstruct the signal from its samples. Let us recapitulate that procedure as it is a very important idea that we should appreciate very thoroughly. What we said was that if you had an original spectrum like this, let me draw it again for you. If you had this original spectrum of the signal band limited to f m, let us say looking something like this and you sampled it at a rate f s greater than twice f m, copies of the original spectrum would be created at every multiple of f s. And reconstruction essentially means retaining the original and cutting off the copies. So, we need a system which retains this and cuts off all the rest. Now, how do you do that? Suppose you pass this whole sample signal, so this is the spectrum of the sample signal. Suppose you pass this sample signal through a linear shift invariant system which has a frequency response. I am writing the frequency response as a function of the cycles per second frequency note. And what is this frequency response that we desire? Let us draw that explicitly. The desired frequency response needs to be 1, the desired frequency response needs to be 1 between just a little before f m, I mean minus f m actually, just a little before minus f m on the negative side and just a little after f m on the positive side of f. So, here I am writing in terms of the cycles per second or hertz frequency and I am saying the desired h f needs to be 1 from let us say minus f m minus delta to f m plus delta. Essentially, you must ensure that f m plus delta is less than f s minus f m, strictly less than. So, that is not very difficult to do. If you go back to the previous drawing of the spectrum, you can see that that should be possible. Look at it here. So, this is f s minus f m here and you have this margin as I pointed out in the previous discussion. As long as you have ensured that f m plus delta remains within the margin, you are doing well. So, you are essentially saying here that f m plus delta keeps the cut off or remains within the margin. Now, let us look at this drawing again of the desired h f. You have f m just a little before here and minus f m here. You know you could have always I mean one could have argued that you could have kept this desired h f 1 up to f m and minus f m you know between minus f m and plus f m and then 0 afterwards. But what is the problem there? The problem is that you might have a tonal component at f m, meaning there might be an impulse in the frequency domain at f m. When will that happen? That would happen when you have a pure sinusoid. You recall that there are impulses in the frequency domain when you have pure sinusoids. So, there is a tonal component at f m and if you make the h f cut off at f m, you could have trouble with that tonal component. So, you need to keep f m plus delta as the cutoff. This is an important and a subtle point. In fact, we can understand it even better. 
if we take just that total component and focus upon it. So, let me explain this point to you. It is a little subtle and we need to understand it well. See, consider a tonal component. When you say a tonal component, you mean a sinusoid with frequency f m. Suppose we sample this at exactly twice f m. So, sampling rate f s is exactly twice f m. What is going to happen? Let us see it pictorially. So, you have the sinusoid. Now, this condition f s is twice f m essentially means that you have two samples per period. Now, that is very easy to see. Suppose, for example, your 0 is located here. So, you have taken one sample here. The next sample would come at the corresponding point on the negative cycle. So, here and the next sample would come here and so on and so forth. So, you could keep doing this. So, these would be the samples. Now, suppose you are unlucky and you take the sample where I am showing you in green. You start sampling it here. What would happen? Your sample would come here and then here and then at every other 0 crossing. So, in the unlucky event that you start sampling the sinusoid at a 0 crossing, all your samples are going to fall at 0 crossings. This is where you have trouble when you sample at exactly twice f m. That is why we said f s must be greater than twice f m. This was a subtle point. I am emphasizing that now because a tonal component at f m that is what it is a tonal component a sinusoid with precisely the frequency f m if not sampled at a rate more than 2 f m can have this trouble of all the samples falling unfortunately on 0 locations. And if all the samples fall on 0 locations there is no way to distinguish between whether you had a 0 signal in the first place or whether you had a sinusoid at all. Now, there is another reason also and that reason is what we are seeing in this business of a margin here. You know you of course, require that margin because you might want to retain this tonal component. There might be an impulse right at the boundary at f m and you do not want to cut off or you do not want the cut off to fall on that impulse. You want the cut off to be beyond that impulse. The impulse also comes in. That is one way to understand why you need that is another way to understand why you need f s to be greater than 2 f m. But there is another more subtle reason which we will now proceed to derive. Let us go back to that frequency response that we drew the desired h f as we called it. Let us go back and see what it looked like. This is what it looked like. Let us find out the corresponding impulse response. So, the corresponding impulse response can be found by taking the inverse Fourier transform. Let me work out the inverse Fourier transform. This, let's do that little bit of work. It's very important. All of us are familiar with the expression for the inverse Fourier transform. Essentially, multiply the spectrum by e raised to the power j two pi f t and integrate with respect to f over all regions where the spectrum is non-zero. In this case. The spectrum happens to be 1 between minus f m minus delta and f m plus delta. Let us put f m plus delta equal to f c. It is a very easy integral to evaluate. Let us evaluate this. This is simply e raised to the power j 2 pi f t divided by j 2 pi t from minus f c to plus f c. A very easy integral to evaluate. Let us simplify this. So, it is e raise the power j 2 pi f c t minus e raise the power minus j 2 pi f c t by j 2 pi t, which is easy to simplify. It is essentially 2 j times sin 2 pi f c t divided by 2 j 2 pi t. And of course, we could multiply and divide by f c and cut off the 2 j's from the numerator and the denominator. So, where are we now? 
that gives us essentially 2 f c times sin 2 pi f c t divided by 2 pi f c t and that is essentially 2 f c times what is called sink you know how to write sink. So, sink 2 f c t you will recall that sink x is essentially sin pi x by pi x. So, we have derived this impulse response here. Let us sketch it where does the sink function go to 0? It goes to 0 at all the integers. So, sink x is equal to 1 for x equal to 0 and 0 for all integer x, x not equal to 0. So, sink of 1, sink of minus 1 and so on. Now, what are we really saying here? You see, we are saying we have this function which is 1 at t equal to 0. So, if I locate this function at the point of sampling, it picks the sample as it is and the integers, where are the integers located? The integers located where 2 f c t is equal to an integer. What does that mean in terms of sample? We shall analyze this in greater detail in the next discussion. It is going to take us a while to understand what this impulse response is doing and that will hold the key. In fact, that will say a lot of things about the system that we are talking about too. It will tell us how we are reconstructing the signal from its samples and it will also tell us something rather disturbing about the system, about the realizability of the system. So, let us wait for the next discussion to look at this impulse response in greater depth. Thank you.